So welcome back. Welcome everybody to Race Matters Friends. Um, we meet every uh, other week, the, the first, no, the second, second and fourth. The second and fourth Wednesday of the month, I always get it wrong. Uh, my excuse is I'm getting old and I'm in graduate school and so I have issues. Um, but usually the first meeting of the month starts at six o'clock and we have a potluck for the first half an hour. We have a guest. Um, this year we're doing Whiteness 103, so those meetings, the first meeting of the month will be, the discussion will be that way. And the second meeting of the month, we like to have uh, a guest and, and talk about other things that are going on in the community. And so Matt has done this blockbuster um, uh, documentary recently and ended up on the front page of the Tribune. And so we thought it would be great <laughs> opportunity to to talk to you and ask you some questions etc cetera, etc cetera. so before we get started does anybody have any questions well just an announcement our next um, whiteness 103 will be Kristen pop who visited us before <laughs> and talks about um, the presence of Africans in Europe so Germany in particular. Flips the script on what we think about um, race in a different context. And so it should be interesting. She gives really fabulous dynamic presentations. Mm -hmm. So she's really fun. Hey, Lori, what's that mean? Yeah. Can, you, can you pull up your questions again? Because I did something. Oh, um, so anyway. Um, so. Matt, can you start by giving us a little background of how you got involved in this, um, into this, and what made you decide to do a documentary? Um, so I've been doing uh, Citizens for Justice for a while now, since uh, like 2010, 2011. Um, growing up in certain parts of Columbia, I got to see a side of the Columbia Police Department. I don't think everybody gets to see, I would say, kind of maybe uh, who they really are, who they don't necessarily want the media to to know that they are or not the side of the Columbia Police Department that the public relations unit presents. And so I've been interested in kind of trying to affect change in that area for a really long time. And I feel like the best way to do that is through the media and through, you know, public relations and all that, because I mean, <sighs> fighting the system within their rules sometimes, it, it's never worked for me. You know, they have all the power when you show up in a courtroom, they have all the power when you show up in a in their arena, but with the media, at least the intent of the media, at least the uh, the dynamic of the media is that it's supposed to be neutral. It's supposed to present both sides. So my hope was that, you know, maybe I could get a, a, a better, a, a fair shake by working with the media on some of these issues. And I got to the point where I realized I kind of probably would have to do my own media if I really wanted to uh, expose truth and kind of institute some justice into things. Right. So um, I don't know if you want to talk about your story, like what happened. I, I can tell you from my son's experience that um, it pulled over and stopped all the time. And it, it's really wore down on him as a person and um, it makes it harder for him now, I think, being targeted like that um, for just being in the world. So I don't know, what is your experience? What do you think, what led you to have these interactions Cops. You were being uh, okay. I, we can spend. I'd say we can spend all night talking about this. I mean, a certain. Um, I I don't know. Just um, the police they make a judgment about somebody. Um, something me wise uncovered in our you know, investigation was that they have this system in their computer system where, are they have this? It's like a database, and officers can put anything they want into it, and another officer can use that as probable cause. They can come forward and say you know, well, hey, the last officer said this, this, and this, and it could be based on nothing. It could be something that that officer put put in there. And so you have uh, you have these interactions with these officers and you have maybe a personality conflict or you have an officer who's overzealous. I never was the type of guy who just, I have a problem letting somebody run over me. Right. Badge, no badge, whatever. So uh, from a young age, I got into a lot of verbal disputes with officers who just, you know, they want to they want to stop, put your hands in your put my put their hands in your pockets, search you, pull you over for no reason, false arrest, all that. It, it gets old, like like you said about your son, like it wears down on you. It gets old, right? And so like, I don't, it just it kind of it builds up. They don't they don't want to um they don't want to back down, and I don't want to back down. So it's just a 
it escalates to where it escalates. So, so talk, talk to me about how you went from that to using the video to document police, you know, practices. Kind of what was your, your thinking and your strategy? So you had those- So originally- Something must have happened for you to go, oh, I'm gonna just, you know, start videotaping these guys. I had, in, in 2010, I had just some incidents that were over the top, uh, an arrest at a, uh, a false arrest at a traffic, at a checkpoint, not even a traffic stop. I had an officer who basically threatened my life, or Sergeant Roger Sluty, because I questioned him on what the, what the policy and protocol was for the way he handled a traffic stop. I had just, I, I felt like I was under attack and I didn't know what to do. I initially, it wasn't really video based. It was more, I sent an open records request. I wanted to get the, I wanted to know about these officers' backgrounds. I want to know, you know, if they're treating me like this, I know I'm not the first person. And what I found out was these are closed records and the department will go to extensive links to protect the, the disciplinary histories of officers. And I thought that was egregious. So I began building a database um, on all the officers I could find information on using Tribune, Missourian, KMIZ, KOMU uh, news articles and kind of putting that together and, and developing a picture of who each individual officer was. And my point was to kind of have a database where people could go in and, you know, grade this officer, talk in the comments, maybe talk about their, their interactions with this officer. And then an officer couldn't just kind of hide behind his badge and hide behind, um, you know, being a police officer. He would have to answer for his actions as an individual as opposed to, you know, just, oh, I'm a cop. Just don't worry about which cop I am. I'm a cop. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could grade cops the way they have that evaluation for teachers online? You know, you grade your professor and you say, you know, what they're like, you know, wouldn't that be, that would be if we that would, did that for cops, right? <laughs> that would be fantastic. I think it'd be very helpful. I think it, it would. <laughs> Just a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um. But so the, the thing I ran into when I was building the database was I needed pictures. You know, it's just like if I, if a person has an interaction with a cop, I mean, some, if you haven't gotten a ticket or something like that, you see them on there, they, they make it, oh, sure. Hold on. they do it on purpose in my opinion. So it's hard to tell who they are. Um, and so when you have a, you know, when you see the picture, a person can say, okay, I got stopped by somebody. Let me look through. Okay. That's him right there. But getting those pictures wasn't super easy. So I basically embarked on a task to go, take pictures of these officers to get and put into the database. And as you can imagine, that didn't go great. I had officers, you know, saying and doing egregious things. I think the, the straw that broke the camel's back was um, a guy was basically being arrested. And I'm, I'm taking pictures of the officer, not even of him. He starts making threats and making jokes and I'm going to find you. I saw your license plate. I'm going to track you down. I'm going to get you. And the officer just like was laughing about it. He thought it was a joke. I was like, okay, I need to bring a video camera out here. Cause like I, you know, taking still photos isn't going to, you know, convey what happened here this day, you know? Hey, Matt. So that's kind of where the, uh, where it escalated. Yeah. So who was yeah. that officer that you were dealing with? Remember? Okay. Um, his name was Brian Graff. He left the department pretty shortly after that. Brian Graff, to... like G-R-A-F-F? -F? Yes. So I, you, I lose you a little bit when you talk fast. So you just have to slow down a tiny bit. So, so you you were doing, got you got you sorry about that. You were doing photography and video video work, right? To build yes. a database. So the limitations were the reaction from the officers, or the limitation was the quality of the pictures, or or there other limitations. So it was primarily just photography, okay. and that's because it was just I just was going out to, to get a picture. I want to build this database. That was my main objective. And I saw that these interactions needed to be recorded because stuff like that was going on. I, you know, I just had like a Canon or a Nikon or something. I forgot what it was, but like right. it wasn't something I could record video with. And so I, you know, basically realized I need to change my strategy up. I can pull a still frame from a, from a, a video, but I can't pull a video from a still frame, you know? Uh, uh, I got you. I got you. So um, I'm just trying to change my view here so that I can get more of a view of you. So, um, we saw that um, the video that you took of a court's proceeding in the case of CJ, were you, was that in the court? Was that in the courtroom or outside? I think it was, I think it was Lawrence, Lawrence Lawhorn, but yes, I, it, it was in the courtroom. So uh, one of the things that we learned from going to court observation was just watching 
the interaction, how people were treated. Um, we have a, a family that we've been going to meetings with in social services, and I feel like there's a similar kind of like disrespect and, and, and intimidation for people of color. And so what did you learn from that experience that you wanted the people to take away from being in the courtroom like that with Lawrence's case? Um, I mean, exactly what you're talking about is um, it, it's not that different. I mean, there's there's a bigger audience there. So maybe it's a little more covert, but I would say it's it's very similar. It's, it's problematic in, in much the same ways that, you know, interactions with officers in, in the field are. So um, you have a person that has a lot of power. It's not really. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. They have a lot of power. Oh, you're fine. I was just saying you have a person that has a lot of power. They don't have a lot of checks and balances to, to, to that power. And so it's a, it's a problematic situation if they choose to, as wise will tell you, if they choose to engage in something, if they choose to be kind of retaliatory, there's not much you can do. I mean, police officers have a uh, qualified immunity. Um, uh, wise, what is the, uh, what is the name of the, uh, the type of immunity that a judge has? Well, a judge has absolute immunity. Absolute. Absolute immunity. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, that, that kind of speaks for itself. So, um, I take it that a lot of court hearings are not, um, videotaped so was that an issue for you to go in there and videotape that court proceeding for Lawrence um it it was that specifically no but like getting to a point where I can put in a media request and get a camera in there it was a it was a rough situation the Missouri actually covered the process there was a court case of a, um, a guy named Tony Lewis from Boonville who was uh, wrongfully charged with murder in Boone County, Tony Lewis in, in Boone County. yes okay. uh, but he's from Boone he's from Boonville but he was charged in Boone County um, in the uh, the break time uh, slaying in uh, I want to say 2010 the homecoming the homecoming uh, murder where they got like nine different people involved and so I worked with Attorney Jennifer Bukowski on that and she essentially you know she w the case was dismissed it was the first um, murder case you know acquitted by a jury in like 47 years at that point. So but what Jennifer, did, what were I'm you sorry? what were you able to show that would help get the case dismissed? So like I worked on the defense team. Um, I did a lot of the video stuff. Like the, the prosecution came with a, a redacted copy of the interrogation, which basically was a highlight reel of Tony Lewis's emotional outburst. Um, and what I was able to come in and put the video together and showing is that like they left him in this, in this room for hours and hours. They come in, they're making fun of him for asking to talk to his mama and stuff like that. Like it was very just, I, it wasn't very professional on, on behalf of, uh, on the part of these major, major crime squad detectives. And so the jury really saw that. Um, one of the other things that we attacked was that there was a, a firearm uh, that was hidden by the police department that showed that this was not just a one-sided thing. This was two sides that were engaging in a, in a gun battle with each other. And essentially a nurse from a, a what, do you, what would you say, a, 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 an urgent care that was right next to the gas station had uncovered this firearm, turned it over to police and told them that she believed it was involved in this situation. Police did not turn that over to any of the defendant's attorneys, but Jennifer had a connection that this, you know, with this urgent care, so the urgent care nurse came and told Jennifer directly, and we were able to put together an argument and present that. I remember the jury was a, a, a federal law enforcement officer for the Department of Homeland Security, so we basically came in and argued police corruption and a federal law enforcement officer, you know, sided with us on that. And so, you know, like it was a it was a big case and it was a big situation and Jennifer was really happy about it. We we're all really happy about it because he got to go home to his kid. He was he had nothing to do with it. They had a video of the entire incident. He's a bystander who refused to cooperate. He told police, this guy just killed somebody. And if I tell you, if I give you information about him, you can't protect me. What what are you gonna do to protect me? And that's essentially why they charged him with murder. Wow. Um was he and a so, man or a white man? I don't remember. Uh, just take a while, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, no, uh, yeah. Everyone involved in the uh, in this was uh, was African American. Um, what happened with KMIZ was KMIZ had a media media request in to videotape the whole thing, and I put one in through my organization to basically act as a, a pool camera. I would be eligible to get footage from KMIZ. So KMIZ goes with this the whole time. They film the whole trial. They, you know, leave me to believe I'm going to get this. One of the reporters calls me like the Sunday after the not guilty verdict and says, 
hey, um, we saw that you have a media request in and we wanted to get an interview with Jennifer. Do you think you could arrange that? We'd be happy to get the footage to you. So I called Jennifer. She went and did the interview. She was happy to do the interview anyway. Um, I called Monday and they told me, yeah, we don't, we don't know if you're a real news outlet or not. So uh, I don't know. We don't know if we're legally allowed to give you the footage. So anyway, I did not get any of the footage of this whole trial, any of this. Um, Jennifer raised hell because she was mad because she wanted her, you know, she spent six days fighting this murder trial and beating it. One of the biggest accomplishments of her career. And now she has no footage of it. I can't put together a presentation and show what with the truth of what happened here. All because basically Cam Izzy's, um, you know, managing editor with uh, his relationship with the prosecutor's office. The Missourian extensively covered this. But um, what came out of that was the judge has basically made a ruling that my organization was a media outlet for future reference on a case by case basis. And I've never had it challenged. So I've been able to put in media requests and get a camera into a courtroom on any case I've asked since then, but it took to get there. So are you, are you holding your and phone? Essentially the argument will. Matt, are you holding your phone in front of you? Yes. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell you something. When you don't... Yeah, am I covering the microphone or something? Yeah, yeah. well, when you're wiggling, it makes your sound go away, but when you're still, like right now... Okay, <laughs> got you. When you're still... All right. When you're still, uh, but your sound is even better, right? So, um, I, want okay. to, I want to be able to get everything that you say. You're saying a lot of great stuff. So, um, I'm like... Okay. You, talking I tend to move my hands and get excited and so um, <laughs> right. you're doing great but I, I want to be able to capture everything you say um, okay so you kind of talked about this a little bit so tell me how your work has changed like how have things evolved since you started um, working on this I mean you've talked about you know now being a, a reporter on a sort of on-call type thing a media person you your credential to do that so people can't interfere with your work. So how has it changed how you do research and how you collect information and, and um, you know, document what you're doing for a particular case? So obviously when I first started doing this, I was just kind of uh, just, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just would go out and just, uh, you know, do whatever I, I thought sounded like a, like the, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. That's the best way to put it. As working with, as I've worked with uh, different law firms, Bukowski Law Firm, Wise Law Firm, and private investigators, Derek Marshall, uh, Rick Gurley, it's really got to the point where I've, I've been able to pick up skills about how to go get information. If there's something that's like, if there's a piece of information that I'm looking for, like I know how to go get it now. I know where that record will be at. I know when a person calls me or you know has a complaint about law enforcement or whatever, I know that these are the steps you take to kind of like look at this person and say, this is, is this a credible report? Is this a credible complaint I'm getting? Or is, you know, I hate to say it, but there are things where I've, I've gotten complaints from people and I've looked into it and it's just, some people are desperate. Some people have charges going on. Some people, they need help. And I, there's just not much I can do for them personally. You know, they need an attorney to go in and beat the case. Me giving media exposure to it isn't going to help very much. Right. And so basically learning how to differentiate between something that I can legitimately help on and something to where maybe I have the best intentions by saying, yeah, let me try to help you on this. But really what I'm doing is just giving them false hope because there's nothing I can really do for their situation, you know? So it reminds me, you know, when I do genealogy, I'm always looking, I'm, I, I'm looking at lots of fragments and pieces of information, right? So sometimes somebody gives you some information from the family and they tell you that it's X, Y, Z, and then you investigate it and you, it turns out it's bogus. And then sometimes they're telling you information because they really want to tell you something else, but they're telling you something else. So, um, you know, I, that sort of, you know, working in a, a jigsaw puzzle mode is kind of exciting for me. So um, I kind of right. hear that in your voice, like, uh, you know, so uh, different for me is I was always looking for a strategy, right? I was always looking for a method. So it sounds like you kind of have a method now to how you approach things and you have a strategy, right? I, yeah. yeah, I've built that exact. That's exactly. I've built that up as I've went along because, you know, when you're just kind of looking for a strategy or looking for a method, it makes things more complicated. But when you kind of have an idea of how to handle this situation, it, it makes it a lot easier to deal with. Right. Especially after you drop a 25 part documentary and you got 15 people in your inbox that think you can save their life from the criminal justice system, you know? So that's kind of 
of depressing though in a way you know that that, that the system is so um corrupt right that the an, a, a, an average everyday person um it becomes a job right to to save your life right because the system is so yeah. and so unwieldy right but it's keeping you busy that's cool um <laughs> yeah. what what do you expect to go from here and like what are kind of your hopes um, with your work? Like what do you hope happens with this documentary and do you have any other projects that you're working on? That are uh, with, with the documentary, I mean, obviously like there are police officers that helped a human trafficker, you know, that abandoned the rule of law and engaged in this operation. Like I want consequences for them. And I'd like for the women in the situation to kind of be able to get closure and maybe people to look at them and say, Hey, like we have some resources, we can help them get them out of the situation. Because um, like Carrie Pruitt, one of the people that spoke to us, for instance, she was happy to speak to us. She was like, Barry's a piece of shit. You know, the fact that he's worked with the police to ruin like everybody's lives is, is a, you know, it's messed up. But like, if I go on camera and I expose this relationship, what am I going to do? You know, her position was prostitution was the only thing she knew how to do, do to make money. And so I'm not the only one out here like burdened by this situation. They are as well. They've come out and I have to say that if their only means of making money is prostitution by come, appearing in the documentary, they've probably, they've damaged that. They've damaged their ability to engage in that. And I hope that some of these agencies and these organizations that are, you know, meant there to help people who are victims of human trafficking, et cetera, et cetera, can jump in and help them as well. As far as like overall, I really don't know. I just need a breather. I need to figure out where to go with things, you know, because this was a lot of work. You know, we worked on this for like two years right. um, and I'm really, I'm really happy with how it came out and I'm really happy that it's getting attention. At the same time, it's kind of like one of those situations where you just take a, take a breath from it and say, oh, now what do I do now? And I'm still kind of in that phase right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, I, I've noticed that I haven't seen any council members or anybody in leadership um, go on the record. I don't know if they've been asked. Um, the silence is very interesting to me, um, given the city manager leaving, uh, the chief of police, un Chief Burton, um, uh, Brian Tate, and our, our recent, you know, gas bag uh, sheriff. <laughs> so, you know, um, they seem. It seems that the system has a way of insulating itself from being questioned as well. What do, you, what do you think about that? Particularly since our role in Race Matters Friends is we're really about holding people in power accountable. And people get mad and say, oh, you guys are too direct and you're too strong and you shouldn't say this and that. Hmm. But if we don't say it, it's, it's not, not gonna get said. And if we don't ask about it, uh, it's not gonna be inquired into, right? So right. Um, this idea that you know people can, say or do whatever, whether it's on the internet or whatever, and not have to answer to it is crazy in my mind. Um, that you have people that carry guns and um, can abuse people's personal liberties and the people who are elected don't say that is some bullshit. Like, that's crazy. To me, it's crazy. What do you think? I mean, politics is their business and calling out, uh, calling out those types of situations is bad for business, you know? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I just Food is I think, a people thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, Wise basically had told me the other night. Maybe Wise can confirm this. That I guess some of the news agencies were saying like they hadn't covered it because they couldn't get a comment from the police department about it. But like that doesn't seem that never stops them when they have a you know they make an arrest or they indict somebody or something like that. They never say, oh well, the defendant didn't make a comment, so we can't run a news story about it. You know, it, that's not how it works on the other side when the shoe's on the other foot. So, I think that's an interesting stance. I think a lot of people are scared of it. I I don't I don't know how to put it. Like, it's a it's a risky thing, even from a news agency. Like, I guess to to promote it. Um, the police, the sheriff's department, Kerry came out and got mad at the news agencies because they covered the firework war last year. And it's like the news agencies are going to cover what's what's important. Uh, somebody uploaded a copy of the of the fireworks war and got nine million views. Like that's newsworthy. A local video of nine million views is newsworthy. So the fact that the news covered it and Sheriff Kerry thinks he can 
intimidate the news into not covering things like that's why you have these situations. You have these news agencies that think if we run a negative story about the police department, the next time they send out a press release or the next time they have an exclusive story, we're not going to get it. And that's kind of that's kind of the mentality that a lot of these like editors and reporters have. You know what was interesting is the video, I think that you shot this video of when Shluti pulled the gun on um, CJ Stock. Yeah. And I could not believe how many views that video got. But that when Andrew uh, Hutchison brought it up at council that it was wrong, he got fired from his job, right? Um, wow. The fact that, you know, even when I worked at the university when, when the student protest was going on, there was this, you know, you cannot be quoted in the media. You have to get our permission, um, you know, and that kind of thing. I mean, so it's, it's this, this craziness, but this idea that you could be an elected official and say no comment in that position, right? And the whole thing yeah. is the and the video that, that stinks too. But um, um, say more about, um, Columbia PD's reputation. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, uh, I don't think anybody knows what to do right now. I mean, I don't know what Glasscock's like, um, what his process is looking like, but I mean, he's, they got to find somebody that's going to clean this mess up because when I started doing this type of work, it, everyone was like, Hey, you need to hurry up, get something out, get something out, get something out. It took me like to get the original database together. It took me almost about a year to get it all together. And throughout that whole time, and including throughout this project, you know, a lot of people like, hey, hurry up and get it out. And then what I always say is, you know, this isn't something I'm, I'm not worried about getting something out today or tomorrow. I'm worried about getting something out right because the police department has issues that are not going to stop today or tomorrow. Right. I'm, I, didn't, I didn't build this organization banking on the fact that, oh, this is a temporary thing. They have issues, you know, that are deep seated that aren't going to go away until they address them. And until they address those situations, they're going to continue to have these type of problems. So. Yeah. yeah. I tried to bring that up last night and talking about, you know, sort of the unspeakable, this idea that people equate being black with crime. Right. And it goes back forever. And that's clearly very deep in the, in the department, this belief that if you are black, you are a criminal, these things, you know, go together. And it's sort of this, disbelief that oh the officers can't believe don't, don't really do that or they can't believe that the officers would be doing this and um you know no one is thinking about the, the women and all the other people who are abused or the people who are not getting paid or the properties that got uh, messed up or the rent that wasn't paid you know these and these are not big time people right that are affected by this and i wonder if, if that's one of the reasons that the council people don't care and don't say anything is because these are vulnerable people that are um, hurt in this situation. They're not, um, they're not Potterfield who has a million dollars, wants a million dollars from taxpayers to pay for something he should pay for himself. <laughs> right. You know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Steve. Well, as far as the council goes, not quite a majority, but um, several members of the council have been contacted with regard to a petition calling for a special prosecutor to investigate um, the Columbia Police Department into involvement with human trafficking in Barry Manthe. And, um, and I've not seen a positive response from any of those people. And, and frankly, as our mayoral candidate here tonight, I, I'd like to know what, if Chris would be willing to sign the petition and call for a special prosecutor to look at this, uh, this horrible situation that was enabled um, by a relationship between the Columbia Police Department and uh, human trafficking of Barry Manson, right. uh, to so that there's a special prosecutor appointed by the governor. As I know Chris has called for an external audit, but an external audit that's done by a friendly police department, a police officer, is going to have very little play. So what I want to say about these audits is there's been several audits already of the police department, and each one each time says the department's actually worse than they were the last time. So we really, I mean, the, the cat is out of the bag that these guys have a cultural um, dysfunction. And so another audit's going to show that they're still dysfunctional. And the fact that Brian Tate can get on Twitter or, and make all those comments, and you've got a, a problem with Twitter too. I mean, you might have erased them, but we've got, they've got racial problems and you've got misogyny problems and people need to answer to that stuff, right? 
need to be able to answer that for that stuff. But in, in, and and audit's not gonna no on I don't no it's 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 a fact. I asked you a question though. But so you, go ahead. Would you be willing to commit to sign a petition to call for a special prosecutor to investigate the Columbia Police Department? My request for the outside audit. Um, do you immediately um, diss the purpose without knowing the purpose? I want a strong vote. The reason I'm doing it, regardless of what you think, and the reason I'm sitting here, is because I want to know what to do about fixing the police department. And you, people in this room's view is important to me. Um, some of you know that I spent my entire career working at many of the issues that are most dear to the people in this room. As to a special prosecutor, Steve, I don't, I, don't, I don't reject the idea, but there are specific legal requirements for a special prosecutor. It's not the governor. Um, what is the governor? What is such prosecutor? I thought the attorney general called, appointed. No, it's, it's, the, special it's, prosecutor. it's the governor and or the county prosecutor. Who thinks he's a county prosecutor? Um, not or the governor. Yeah, um, and I don't know that the evidence is there. I don't know what the evidence is myself, so I don't just I don't reject the idea. I don't know yet the answer. To, that's a I think it's a good question that I frankly hadn't thought of, and I don't know the answer to. I'm not going to jump to an answer because I don't know um, whether it meets the criteria. All that kind of stuff. I was pretty serious about the request um, for an outside look. The, the other outside looks were pretty cursory and still found a lot of bad stuff. Um, okay, I, I don't want to get off. I don't want. I don't want. I don't okay. want to go into that. I don't want to go into that audit stuff because it's done, and we're not going to waste our time on that. Um, the question is, and you haven't answered if you'd support a special prosecutor or not. Yeah, or I said I didn't know the you answer. You didn't know. Okay, we're done with that. My, my other quick question, have you watched any of the documentary that's Citizens for Justice? No. Okay, so then he can't answer because he didn't watch it. Um, well, so some questions about that, the documentary too, that I think Matt wanted to address. Yes. Um, Peggy, say more about that. I mean, well, I'm looking. we were, um, a lot of us have watched the documentary for these parts of it. And uh, one question we had that was, it does a really good job of documentary, documenting the uh, exploitation of women by this guy, this monster. Um, and, you know, you allow them to speak in their own voices. It's very powerful. What about um, the purpose of this group is to look at racial equity. Um, what about race and how that got implicated in the story through his connections, um, through drugs and um, other kinds of, of exploitation? Because he's not being in taking advantage of other people um, in the community, kind of like a, a encouraging um, people that serve his own interests and right. have any ideas about that I mean in what ways does in what ways does privilege serve him I would say uh, that the majority of the people that he turned in the police department were nonviolent drug offenders who were young African American males um, Iris actually gave us some some quotes uh, about basically he had a distaste for that demographic. Um, and had some very negative things to say about that. And that basically, there was almost a personal level to it. He had some of the ideas, like when you think of the stereotypical pimp, he had some of the ideas of that he was better than, he, he wasn't a real pimp because that was the stereotypical idea of a pimp. It was a, you know, African-American man who's, you know, a beating and abusing women. And that's kind of why he held himself in high, high esteem. He looked at himself as he was better in that situation because of that and um again most of the people he turned in from our from our evidence which is a lot of people were young african-american males involved in the drug trade but not necessarily violent you know someone who you know someone who has who's 
engaging in a victimless crime, basically. So do you remember reading the, the police the report that Robert Fox wrote and he said that violent crime was attributed mostly to uh, marijuana sold by black men in Colombia? I'm not. I'm, I don't put too much uh, too much faith in Robert Fox or Dwayne Carey's assessment of. Do they have statistics? Were statistics backed with this, or was this just kind of like, let me write this in a report and see it sounds good? Like that's what it always is. It's 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 just it's hearsay. It's not. It wouldn't be admissible in court. It's just an officer saying something that sounds good in his head. Pull some statistics out. You know. Uh, Steve has another comment. Well, you were talking about if there was any privilege involved, any white privilege involved. Um, first of all, Barry Manthe and to a lesser degree, Ron Clark were the kingpins, the operators, the wheelers, dealers, the controllers of this problem. And they're charged with using the internet to promote uh, prostitution. Whereas Kenneth Jones, whose sister worked the brothel, who had a very tertiary involvement with the brothel and the working girls thereof, is charged with all these heinous crimes, which all the evidence, well, all the evidence, but the majority of the evidence we've been uncovered don't support. So if you have a black man who's in proximity to illegal conduct and you blame the black man and make him the villain, and the FBI painted this narrative that the media jumped on and ran with it, that Kenneth Jones was this vicious, uh, food controlling, beating, gun threatening, Pimp who coerced all these these terrible young women into horrible situations. Whereas the fact was, Kenneth Jones would come from Milwaukee and Columbia, see his sister. He was romantically involved with a couple of the working girls, and then he'd be gone and he'd come back. And so he, he was around it, but he was nowhere controlling it. And I'm frankly, working girls in the documentary it, said, I didn't know that he was involved because he wasn't controlling anything. But because they wanted to protect their confidential informant, they made this young black man a vicious villain because it always fits into the media's narrative. If you've got a young black man, you make them the vicious, vicious villain and the media loves it. Do you remember last year the, those shootings that were going on downtown and they blamed uh, a, a black restaurant owner down the road? Do you remember that? Um, black restaurant owner for producing the shootings and stuff downtown. I'm just saying that it's a constant trope, right? That it's, it's, it's black people's fault, that it's crime. And then where the real crime is, they don't seem to know. Right. You know, like know. they're saying there's gangs and stuff, but we, we, we never see them working on that. What do you, what do you make of that? I, they, the gangs, as the gang thing, like, <laughs> They, they talk about that a lot. What is, what do you know about that from covering the police? That's a, that's a tough issue. Um, I, the police go after who they want to go after. Um, I don't specifically remember the one about, but a couple of years ago was the big downtown shooting. They caught it on the cameras and everybody, you know, it was just rushed to judgment. They locked a young guy up named Eric Cravens. Um, and he spent like four months in jail. And then a Taco Bell video came out and Eric Cravens was on surveillance video of Taco Bell would include at the time of the shooting. So, you know, they, um, I, I think they, they make these judgments in their head and they look for evidence to back that narrative. You know, as a, as a law enforcement officer, you're supposed to be an objective fact finder, collect the facts and objectively put it into a report and turn it over to a prosecutor. When you form a narrative in your head and you collect evidence that supports that narrative, if you work hard enough, you can, you can, in a lot of cases, uh, as they say, uh, indict a ham sandwich. You can, you can find evidence of anything that you want if you ignore all the evidence that points in other directions. And I think that's what happens a lot of the times in these situations. As for the gang situation, I, I, the biggest issue with the gang situation is no one can agree on what the definition of a gang is. The FBI has one definition. CPD likes to change their mind on what the definition of a gang is. And I don't want it. I don't like the, uh, if a person commits a crime, you know, and you're going to pursue them for the crime. Okay understandable when you start doing the enhancement charges and you start saying okay well you're involved in this but also this is a gang situation it a lot of these cases it becomes okay the prosecutors they have a lot of discretion as to when to use these situations as to when to use these enhancements right and i don't i don't trust them to use those appropriately so what do you what do you think 
to CPD to behave the way that they do in cahoots with the court system? Is it, I mean, what do you, what do you think, what do you think it is? They've been doing it forever. I mean, <laughs> they've never been put in check. They've, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, no, go ahead. They've never been put in check. I was gonna say I, they've been doing it forever. They've never been checked. Obviously, the area has a, a reputation as Little Dixie. I mean, it's if nothing if nothing gets put, you know, if there's no accountability, everything will just stay the same. It is, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years what happens when there's a shakeup. I I don't like Burton. I don't think he's a he's a good guy. I think he picks and chooses just like the rest of them. But you saw what happened when he fired one officer. It seemed like I don't think he did it for the right reasons. I think he did it because it was it was politics for him. You know, he thought it would gain him the favor that he wanted. And the result was all the rest of the officers tried to sign a petition to get him fired, to, you know, rush in and just destroy his life. They wanted his retirement taken, all of this. And the reason behind that is because they had this level of like, what you might call blue, blue privilege, to where they had never been held accountable for these type of situations. But you broke a guy's neck in a holding cell and you cast cost the taxpayers of Columbia $300,000. Like that money isn't, doesn't just grow on trees. So as much as you feel kind of entitled to be in these situations where you do stuff that costs the city money, that's at the point where you cross the line, you know, like that's, that's where even the people who are in positions of power, who don't care about the plight of poor people, don't care about the plight of people in, in uh, persons of color, that's the point where you cross the line. And those officers didn't take that well because they weren't used to being put in that position. So I, I mentioned last night at council that this whole thing with Sanders was a missed opportunity to have a teaching moment. Right. I mean, the irony of the officers being upset because they got in trouble. Sanders got in trouble for, you know, tying this guy up to the ring. And their argument is, but we've always been able to do that. Right. And <laughs> yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Right. Like no, no one was out there. <laughs> right. And but the cops are mad because you're getting you're messing up our ability to to you know uh, tie people up because they're kicking the door right and right. My is, so what they're kicking the door they're not hurting you they're locked in there yeah. right so this this control this control thing um is 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 really huge in their culture so to me it was a missed moment for the chief to say you know what this practice that we have even though it's not in the rules it should be in the rules and we shouldn't be treating anybody like this but then, so that goes away, and it goes on all these years, and no one talks about the fact that you guys beat this guy up, you cost the city all this money, and none of the officers feel any responsibility for what, for what Same thing when they had the Darren Wilson day, right? A missed opportunity to say, wait a minute, what happened in Ferguson, right? What happened in the Ferguson Police Department? What did Chief Burton tell us? Well. Um, Darren Wilson wasn't found guilty. I'm like, that's not what the case was about. There were two cases, right? But so these are just, these are huge. The, the irony is there's powerful lessons to learn in both of them. And there was no leadership, no voice at all to call attention to people's lives that were impacted by police behavior. I, I, I've never heard any remorse from anybody, um, from any police in this town about any of it. Right, right, and it's unfortunate. It just shows it's almost like they don't want to change. Like that's not true. I have spoken to a couple of officers who said, you know, actually, you know, that wasn't cool. Um, but Chief Burton used it politically, like you, like you did, um, and burned the guys. And so, of, of course, on top of all that, the guys were mad because they felt like Chief Burton didn't have their back. I'm just saying, he didn't have your back, so you can beat people up, like. <laughs> managers, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me, right? It's like right. lives are expendable um, in a really violent uh, way, and, and no one says anything. I'm sorry, Steve has something he wants to add. Well, um, Burton's predecessor, Chief Bain, was a horrible commander as far as discipline in the department. Set a horrible example by parking illegally in front of the department every day and just enabled all sorts of bad conduct. Sanders was one of the defendants in, in that civil rights lawsuit against the Columbia. So I've seen Sanders' uh, personnel file. And I've seen <laughs> the 
was public from his appeal of his firing. Sanders should have been fired within a month of going on the street. Wow. Uh, he should not have been a cop for any period of time. He displayed a horrible, horrible attitude and approach to force and to women and to people of color. Uh, he, he should not have been a cop. Now, you know, my, my first career was in the military police. And, so, and my niece is a cop in Kansas City. So I actually consider myself pro-cop, but I'm pro-good cop. Uh, Sanders has two redeeming characteristics. He's honest to a fault, and he's brave. He'll go through the door, he'll lead, but other than that, he is a horrible temperament to empower as a police officer. And we empowered him and excused him and permitted him to all sorts of horrible, reckless behavior, uh, all sorts of Un, un, unjustified uses of force, um, and, and, and so there was a lot of things with Sanders that that exemplified the problems with the department that Burton, to a degree, inherited. I mean, Bain was truly wretched as chief. Burton was weak to poor. So weak to poor is better than wretched, but but it's not. What it was I, I, I don't know, race matters may, uh, anybody have any uh, questions for Matt? I just want to say for the, the last point for us to think about is we do not have a, 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 a chief of police right now. We have an acting who I hope does not become the interim or the chief and, and we need a new city manager. So um, I think it's an opportunity to really think about as it kind of puts on your mind what, you're, what you would hope to see in um, a new chief and new city manager. I like to say, reimagine what this would look like. <laughs> so I'll let Matt go first. What do you think, Matt? Somebody that will hold officers accountable. Someone that uh that's not afraid of uh of the backlash of being a, a strong leader that puts somebody in check when they do something they're not supposed to. Yeah. Anybody else? For the for the chief of police? Yeah. They're doing the city manager first. They're doing the city manager first, and then the city manager gets to hire the, the chief. So it's the it's the city manager's employee. Right. So how is the city manager? So right now, yeah. for the city manager, they actually have a search firm that's going to be doing the search for, uh, and they're actually going to the search firm is actually going to be meeting with different groups to get feedback on what they on what they want in the city. So I think that's pretty good. Yes. Well whenever you're done with me, I have one request. Okay. Well I would ask that if you've not signed the petition calling for a special prosecutor, uh, that you do so you can go to uh, either my personal or my law firm uh, website and there's petition to change that org calling for a special prosecutor to to investigate the relationship between the Columbia Police Department and human trafficker Barry Manthe. Uh, there are supporting documents and there are links to the documentary uh, from Citizens for Justice for Police Protective Pimp. Uh, 25 uh, chapters, and it was not a two year project, Matt. It was a year and 11 months. So, <laughs> which, <laughs> okay. I stand corrected. You were one month. I stand corrected. <laughs> Should we, should Race Matters respond as a group or should we do it individually? Well, I would ask Race Matters to take a, an official position calling on. Right, right, right. So we're just, I'm um, just curious how we should, how we should, we have to talk with our board about how to do that. All right. On the petition ask, you would name your name and your organization. Yeah, okay. okay, okay, okay. I didn't know if we should. I didn't know, but, okay. So what, do they need to get further behind that comment? Well, what's it, when we were taking depositions uh, in Kenneth Jones' state case, um, Assistant Chief Richenberger invoked his Fifth Amendment protection, um, did not answer incriminating questions. Uh, and other officers told provable lies in the deposition. <laughs> well, test a lie. Uh, test a lie. <laughs> there's never a lie. Did you hear that deal, Roberts? Roberts well, there's never a lie. Uh, Randolph, <laughs> uh, during the deposition, testified that he hadn't brought up Barry Matthew uh, at 
and he didn't know about the Barry Matthews relationship with Kenneth Jones for the traffic stop. He also testified the traffic stop was for using, failing to use a turn signal and turning from Providence on the business street. But the dash cam from this vehicle showed that Kenneth Jones' vehicle used the turn signal. So there were several different times during the deposition uh, that Officer McKiff, former Officer McKiff, lied. Uh, there were some times when uh, Sergeant Sinclair said statements of fact that were not supported by the record. I'm going to be generous with Officer uh, Sinclair because I think, as a rule, he tries to do it well. But I think that because of the relationship between the brothel and the Columbia Police Department, officers feel pressure not to acknowledge it, feel pressure to conceal their relationship. And so, Sinclair, I actually recommend gets a pass for the statements that are questionable, that aren't supported by the factual records that we have, police reports to the contrary. Uh, and a couple of other officers said things that were disputable. But, but, but McKiff, flat out lied. So are most of the officers that are in your documentary, are they still working for the police department? Or have they left or? All of my kids are still working at the department. Well, I have a random question. Sorry. Yeah. At one point, is a police officer classified as like a public figure versus a private citizen? Well, uh, I think that is a good question. But I think that any time an officer has at any point ever made a public arrest that's been newsworthy, they become a public figure. <laughs> For all purposes, well, I mean, well, they're acting in the capacity as public citizens, responsible for their behavior. So I would think that that would be a responsible for these citizens for their actions. Well, we do, we do pay them, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we do their salaries. Uh, that counts for something, doesn't it? Well, it tends to be privacy interests. Uh, are you talking accountability interests, which so, are not always the same thing? For example, as a private citizen, I can hold a business responsible for their business interests by leaving them a negative review. Right. Could we do that for individual police officers? I think that if there was a system set up, that it would be possible and it would not be inappropriate, especially if you had a basis for it. That's what I, that's what I mentioned at the beginning, but, that, but, like teachers. But frankly, I, 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 I practice civil rights law, and I, I've since decided I'm going to stop that because um, civil rights law doesn't matter in this district. <laughs> I had a federal I had a federal judge that ruled that there's no right to film the police in public. And that's what I'm <laughs> uh, that federal judge is the only judge to make a ruling like that in the country. Six other that, that has been in sustained the country. by, by the, so by the yeah. Circuit Court of Appeals. Six other federal circuits have said, no, we have an absolute right to film the police in public. But this federal judge and the Eighth Circuit said no, there's no right to film the police in public. Steve, Chris, you wanna you wanna comment on that? about the, the policeman as a public figure. Correct me if you think I'm wrong about this. I believe insofar as a specific action is concerned, policeman rest me on the street. Insofar as that particular action, he is a public figure, or she is a public figure. A chief is always a public figure, I think. Um, but is the police a public figure the way that when I was, Judge, I was a public figure where it was all on the table. I think not, probably. Well, I, I would disagree in part. If they are acting in their authority and capacity as a police officer, yeah. yes. they're a public figure. That's right. Uh, I, if, they're, if they're at home doing something that's not law enforcement related, I think there's a strong argument if they're not in the command staff that they're not a public figure. Well, it comes back to some of the stuff that's tainted his Twitter feed. And him acting or posting in his private yeah. world, identifying himself as a police officer, but doing inappropriate things as a police officer. I think once he identifies himself as a police officer, he's he's, he's, he's a public yeah, and I think you can leap into being a public figure. Uh, you can put yourself in that position by taking specific actions. I believe that his aggressive posting. In, and his role as a cop certainly made him be, put him in a position of being a public figure. And that changes, by the way, tort law with regard to him. And when he was, and frankly, when he was listing that he was a police officer, he was 
asserting agency on behalf right. of the police department. Um, and, and one other thing, Chris, will you watch the documentary? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And ten, ten. Um, other questions, comments? I'm sorry. And, question from Matt. Uh, I'm trying to get a handle on how widespread a problem do we have around this particular case uh, in the police department. Are we talking about a small number of officers within the department? Are we talking about something that's pervasive through the department? So I would say the actual people that dealt with Barry Manthe, I couldn't say exactly how many, but it wouldn't be a whole lot. I would say what it would be was would be that every officer, or at least the majority of the officers, were aware of that relationship and let it continue and ignored it. And basically, it was kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod, you know, hey, leave this guy alone. Um, one of the parts of the documentary, he obviously, uh, Iris talks about when Barry gets pulled over, he immediately asked for Kathy. He asked for one of his handlers, hey, you need to call Kathy. So all of these officers that are having these interactions with him, I mean, he's boasting about it. He's saying, hey, you need to call this person. You need to call this person. So while the actual officers who handled him may not have been a large group of officers, I think a very large group of officers were aware of the situation and allowed it to continue. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, uh, I'm actually the same as I am, um, but I was wondering how, other than, you, know, you mentioned that, um, that you said the police were lying and stuff, um, how did you know that they were working like, with or just kind of ignoring Barry Manning in the fall, um, in the broad hall, like, how did you know about that, that the police were? So from Iris originally, and Iris had been in the brothel for a long time and observed a lot of this. And a lot of the women who were involved in the situation had drug problems. Iris did not. And so Iris gave us a lot of leads. Um, Iris, obviously, one of the people who was uh, interviewed. Iris gave us a lot of leads to look into, uh, connected us with a lot of people. And uh, the reports that Wise got, kind of, as we got all of this together, kind of helped build a picture that, uh, you know, there's, there's a relationship there. And I would say Iris was probably the key to kind of busting that wide open. And did you, um, so did you find anything, this, her name's Iris? Okay. Um, I'm sorry? I, I was just being nice. Um, so you said that she had these relationships and um, did she lead you to other people that gave you a little bit more evidence on that or was it just her? Um, her uh, a lot of the women who were involved, um, who were interviewed for this, um, either Iris contacted them or at least, you know, Wise was able to say, hey, you know, um, we spoke to Iris, you know, we're not just somebody showing up out of nowhere. Like, we, we're here for the right reasons. You know, we want to expose this situation. And so there's like, I think, seven women we spoke to, um, at least. And so a lot of those, that's kind of how we were, we were connected to them, was through that. And so each woman kind of told a different part of the story. Um, some of them told about how Barry would hand them the phone and, and, and put them in contact with a certain officer, Kathy Dodd, for instance. And she would say, hey, I heard you in this case or in this investigation. And so as we went on, you know, we kind of, it, it was a piece by piece situation, an ever evolving situation. That's probably what, what took the majority of the time is that just when we thought we knew everything, there was something new came along. And, and, and frankly, we got a lot of police reports which detail uh, police finding drugs. We're going to wrap up in a minute, okay? And take gotcha. I got like 3% battery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, there, there were a lot of, besides the, in, in five of the, the women who had worked at Barry's Brothel were incarcerated when we interviewed them. Two weren't. Um, and so, but there were a lot of police reports which, frankly, more than justified arrest of Barry and there are other people at the brothel for drug possession and probably drug dealing, drug paraphernalia, and there was no arrest made. So, and I was going to say to add to that, there was police reports that detailed Barry giving them information in situations, leading them to rooms in the brothel to help them arrest a person who has a warrant. Um, you know, just the, the situation was spelled out. There's, I want to say over a hundred police reports. And so over the course of all these years, this guy has, you know, a hundred plus police reports 
no criminal history in this offender. Um, the police reports time after time just kind of, they spell out the situation. They spell out that Barry is known for prostitution. He's known for running these houses that are filled with drugs and he provides them information at the end of a lot of those reports. So, so my computer is going to die. I, I can't get one more question in, but I want to know, what are you going to do with those police reports? Are you going to digitize them and put them online or what? They should be on Wise's website, uh, on Wise's on the blog post related to the documentary. Oh. I think they're, I think they're individually in the chapters, but one thing that needs to be done, I think just everything needs to be put together in like one, one place to where a person can just look through the entirety, you know, of like all the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. A digital archive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Any, any last questions before my computer dies, Renee? What, what were the women, have you watched, you haven't watched them yet. So what were the women prosecuted for, Renee wants to know? A lot of them were, were drugs. They, a lot of these women had drug addictions, and Barry Manthe basically used these drug addictions against them to kind of keep them trapped at the brothel. But also, when one would get caught in possession of, of something, that was kind of used as leverage to get them to either cooperate or, you know, for Barry to say, you know, hey, like, you can't go anywhere else. Women would leave the brothel because they wanted to leave Barry's situation, and he would call and have them arrested because he knew they had a warrant. It was kind of like a, like a card that he kept, you know, up his sleeve, you know, a trick that he kept up his sleeve. I don't, I don't know the analogy, but it was something that he, uh, the leverage that he, he held. Uh, Peggy has a well, question. Just, just one last comment. I hope everybody watches the documentary because you also make mention that many of the customers, which is, we have left those people out are were prominent people in Columbia, prominent men in Columbia, and probably a lot of many students. Where are those men's so, names? Where's the list? So uh, they're out there, you know, no consequences, and maybe even protected. Um, so that's the that's another part of the equation that missing is missing. Briefly, man. Uh, up through 98, there were significant portions of the Columbia Police Department that wanted to hold Barry Manthe accountable, although there were there were an internal war between them. Barry got an indictment in 98 and fled. When he comes back and the they indictment is it. dismissed in 2003, he becomes a golden. And until he want, wanders into an FBI sting, uh, so he's twice been charged with felony promoting <laughs> prosecution, uh, and both those charges had one was dismissed in 2003 and the other was amended to trespassing and he paid a $250 fine. Now, when you go from federally promoted prostitution, which is a sex offense where you have to register as a sex offender, to trespassing and $250 fine, you celebrate a good day. Okay, I think we lost Matt. He's gone. All right. I think we're done. Uh, he's on loose. Frankly, uh, significant information indicates he's operating an alcohol service to this day. So the question is, Weird. if he had been black, would, would the Columbia Police Department have made that same deal if he had been black? Do I have to answer that? <laughs> I don't believe so. Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> that, that's the issue. Well, that's I, I don't believe the tolerance would have been as acceptable to them had Barry been a black. The understanding is he has a biracial son. He does. 